this work? Oh, yeah. Okay, great. Well, can we start the music, please, again? The one we had at the beginning? Uh, <laughs> this has got to be the coolest place for a conference. I mean, this is <laughs> the coolest. Anyway, back to reality. Uh, <laughs> My lab has um, used the major heat shock genes of Drosophila melanic acid, or especially Drosophila HSP70 genes, as a model system to studying the mechanisms of uh, transcription regulation and uh, the interplay of these mechanisms, transcription mechanisms, with chromatin structure. And the model has uh, several attractive features. Um, one is, of course, it's, it's these major genes are robustly activated many hundreds of fold. Uh, the r response is in really very rapid, happens within tens of seconds, and it's highly synchronous. So you can watch as factors come into the gene and then progress through, and, and this puts some limits on, on what these factors are, are doing. Uh, the, the principles and underlying mechanisms are proving to be general, much more general than I would have ever imagined. And finally, uh, in Drosophila, the polytene chromosomes provide amplified signal and resolution for, for the kinds of studies that uh, Thomas just told us about, um, where you can begin looking at individual genes and watch recruitment of factors and watch the dynamic of factors on those. I'm not going to talk about that, but I will uh, give you a little bit of a review of what we've learned over the years uh, uh, from chip chromatin IP experiments and from some immunofluorescence and, and live cell imaging uh, when we've done our focus gene studies. Uh, th this is work, our work, and of course, work of, of many labs I'm trying to summarize here. Um, and I'm focusing on just a couple of, of uh, features uh, in the non of, the, some of the gene like HSP70 in the non-heat shock and heat shock conditions. So, well, before heat shock, uh, let me just point out that, that there is a, a striking feature that we noticed in the, the mid-'80s, uh, 1980s, that is, um, that, uh, that there's a polymerase associated with uh, the, the gene before it's even induced, and it's made a short RNA, somewhere between 20-something and, and, and 50 bases, usually, and, uh, and it's paused. It's a configuration we call paused, and we know now that there are pausing, stabilizing factors, DSIF and ELF, that help hold that in place. Uh, the GTFs, general transcription factors, that bring in the polymerase also seem to help retain that polymerase in that pause configuration. Uh, there's a GAGA factor, a general transcription factor, that we know is associated with many of these genes that, uh, that's, that uh, seems to have a role, as you'll see, in, in opening chromatin structure. The heat shock factor is the major um, uh, regulator. It's the uh, master regulatory protein. It's uh, weakly associated with the genes before heat shock, but after heat shock, it trimerizes and then uh, becomes associated with uh, the, the major genes in dramatic fashion. And it recruits a number of, of factors that allow then, uh, and, and in particular, one of the factors is this PTFB kinase, which phosphorylates the components on this pause complex, including the polymerase and the pausing factors, and now polymerase now can escape into productive elongation at a much higher rate, from this background rate of once every 10 minutes to now once every four seconds. Okay, um, so the heat shock response, however, involves more than just our, our model heat shock proteins, and what I'd like to talk about today, uh, the title says local, we're, we're sort of finished with the local part of this. We're going to use genome-wide methods now to look at the mechanisms of transcription and its regulation, making use of of all the statistical power you have when you, when you look at many, many things at once, many genes at once. And so uh, I'll start by focusing on the master regulatory protein, the heat, heat shock factor's role in the heat shock response. And first, let me just summarize very briefly some published work in this paper and a subsequent paper that shows that uh, by CHIP-seq that HSF binds to uh, many sites upon heat shock. There are very few sites before uh, heat chunk that are occupied at all, and, uh, but, and, and even these show dramatic increases upon heat chunk. And now we have, after heat chunk, something like 460 some peaks uh, genome wide in the Drosophila genome. And 95% uh, and, uh, of these uh, have good heat chunk elements, so uh, as one might expect. And this means, of course, I think that, that there's potential that many genes could be induced by heat chunk acting locally or at a distance. We know that, that the heat shock response doesn't involve just the major heat shock genes. That the, um, there are many more genes, but they've been sort of ill-defined and not well characterized. So 
uh, to get an understanding of uh, the heat shock response at, at the transcription level, we re resorted to uh, some of these new methods that we've developed in the past several years. Um, uh, the, the first method I, I just mentioned briefly, which is the precursor of the method we'll be describing. Um, the, so this original method was GrowSeq. I think some of you have probably heard about that, and, and maybe some of you have used it. Uh, I'm sure some of you have used it. Uh, it where you do nuclear run-ons and look genome-wide at, at the distribution uh, density of polymerase. Uh, and this makes use of a, an affinity tag that one incorporates during the run-on, a bromo U UTP. Uh, what I'll be describing today is, is uh, more, I'll be describing more of, is, is ProSeq data, which is a simpler protocol for those of you who want to take it up. It only takes three and a half days rather than two weeks. Uh, and it's less challenging, and it works, I think, better. And there are new protocols that make it work really well, so if you're interested uh, in getting those. Um, so this ProSeq is, is like GrowSeq, except instead of using uh, this uh, Bromo UTP, we use a biotin nucleotides. And biotin nucleotides, um, shown here by the yellow, our yellow dot here, uh, when you do the run-on, they do get incorporated. And we initially thought they, they didn't uh, because there wasn't much transcription that we could detect from the, the, these lo loci initially in our, in our biochemical assays. But it turns out that the biotin uh, NTP gets incorporated in it and it effectively chokes the polymerase. So we, you have a run-on of one, one base. And so you can then isolate that RNA, fragment it, and do three affinity purifications, just like we do in GrowSeq. We know these affinity purifications give us something like a million-fold purification of the nascent RNA. And, uh, and then one can uh, do ligation-mediated PCR and, and sequence from the three prime end, and that defines where the polymerase was at, at near base pair resolution. And so this technique has uh, some, some advantages, like, like many, shares many of the GrowSeq advantages which uh, for looking at RNA expression and, and changes in expression, it gives you the genome-wide distribution of all polymerases across the entire genome. Uh, you get snapshots of changes in transcription as they happen, so you can kinetically follow these. Uh, it, it's, uh, the, the assay is not affected by the levels of accumulated RNA. You don't have to get new levels of, above that. You can watch the changes on the genome directly. And if you have a repression taking place, you can see the repression happening. You don't have to wait for the RNA to decay. It's base pair resolution. It's highly, highly sensitive, as I mentioned. And it's strand specific. So uh, we applied this to Drosophila as two cells doing a heat shock and, and taking time points at 30 seconds, two minutes, uh, five, 10, 20 minutes, and then doing proceed on these. And this is the work of Mike Gurton and Fabiana Duarte. And by comparing then, um, the replicates, we can see that the, the, for each type of experiment, the, the replicates agree very well with our values, 0.98, 0.96, and, uh, and for, for all the time points that we analyze. And here's just a browser shot, a couple browser shots showing uh, a upregulated gene that was paused in non-heat shock, but then it uh, is activated upon heat shock. Here's a downregulated gene that's, that's turned off, and we're seeing uh, all these, these, both types of regulation, and we can look at that genome-wide and collect all of the genes that are changing uh, at, at various time points using uh, a, a, a DE-seq package where we're looking at the ratio of the heat shock to non-heat shock full change in gene, uh, in in gene expression as measured by ProSeq, uh, comparing uh, initially, say, a 30-second to the non-heat shock case. There's no change up or down. Uh, two minutes, very little change, but at five minutes, we're already beginning to detect a change consistent with our earlier local gene studies that we've done um, years ago. But at 20 minutes, we have about uh, 1,100 genes that are uh, significantly upregulated and 1,700 or so genes that are downregulated. So there are, there's a, a complex response going on here. So what is the role of HSF uh, on gene expression? And so one can begin looking at the, the, the different classes of genes, those that are activated, those that are unregulated, and those that are repressed in, in green, blue, and red here, and, and ask, from the, from the start site, you know, if you're going out at distances on this log scale, if you go out to 1,000 base pairs, for instance, um, what are the differences? Well, there's a big difference in that activated genes do have more heat shock factor bound uh, uh, molecules. So this is the cumulative frequency of HSF bound genes. And if, if you go out to 1,000 kb, about, they're about 20 percent. Uh, but it's certainly much different from uh, unregulated and repressed, which argue that HSF is not functioning uh, on on, on those. 
So HSF binds closer to activated genes, but HSF is present in only about 20% of these activated genes. And when, when it's there, though, it gives a, a, a if you compare these HSF bound genes as being and having an HSF within a kilobase of the start site, they're a bit more ro robustly expressed, uh, induced, but the unbound are still induced, and still some of them induce quite well. So the HSF bound genes do have stronger induction, but we have these other genes that seem to be um, working without any nearby HSF. So what does this mean? So 20% are activated. What, what is activating HSF in the unbound genes? And one is they could be that just the HSF bound genes are not detectable by our chip ChIP-seq assay, and there's some HSF there. Uh, is HSF binding at the distant sites, are enhancers working at a large, long distance, in the case of heat shock factor regulation? Uh, or is there another factor responsible for their activation that we don't know about? And so we, to test those models, uh, those ideas, uh, we uh, knocked down uh, HSF. And here's just a, a set of controls that show uh, quantification controls comparing to the knockdown. We see from this and, and actually further dilutions that HSF is actually uh, knocked down to about 1% its normal level by these experiments. So it, you have really quick, uh, fairly efficient uh, removal of HSF, or depletion of HSF. And, uh, and then we can do ProSeq, measure you know, the, the transcription engaged polymerases at 20 minutes and look at the gene body reads to get a feel for the level of transcription and the changes that happen when you knock down H the, the master regulatory protein. And so there's very little change in the repressed or the uh, upregulated, but there, is, there are changes in the uh, uh, activated genes. And the, uh, they're, sh they're shown here in, in red, significant changes. Uh, we're comparing here just the HSF RNAi uh, levels uh, after heat shock, 20 minutes, compared to a control, which is the LAC-Z RNAi. And we can see the genes uh, who are, that are underrepresented after uh, knockdown of HSF. They're dependent on HSF. And so just looking at expanding that figure again, we can see that there are a lot of genes that are HSF bound genes that, uh, that, that are uh, dependent upon HSF. It's nice, uh, but uh, induction of uh, most HSF unbound genes stays unchanged. So there are unbound genes that don't seem to care about HSF, which is telling us that it's not because we're not detecting HSF or HSF is acting at a distance. Uh, it, it, it must mean that there's something else going on. So in summary, uh, only a, a fraction uh, of the 20% of the activated genes have nearby HSF. Uh, and these have stronger, stronger induction, but the others are still induced. Uh, and HSF is uh, acting at a distance can't explain the majority. And so that there's another factor that we, or more, that we are uh, actively pursuing at the moment. Okay, so how does this master regulatory protein, HSF, induce transcription mechanistically? Um, and so first, I'd, I'd like to take a step back and have us think about um, uh, the, the, the transcription cycle and, and the various steps where transcription factors can be working. Okay, so uh, in principle, uh, to, to express RNA, we need to, to go through a number of steps that, that are, many of which are, have been shown to be transcription factor dependent. Uh, chromatin opening, pre-initiation complex assembly, initiation, promoter proximal pausing, escape from the pause, productive elongation, termination, and then eventually the recycling of polymerase into uh, onto the promoter for another round. Uh, now, let me, well, let me just point out there's been a lot of uh, effort in these early stages of recruitment, opening chromatin recruitment and initiation. Uh, while I don't think initiation uh, in, in mammalian cells per se is ever or seem to be rate, rate limiting, or it doesn't seem to be very rate limiting, um, and I can exp talk about that privately with any of you later on, um, there's certainly recruitment is a major role of regulation, but we were fascinated by the fact that the heat shock genes and many other uh, genes seem to have a polymerase already on their promoters and, the, and it seemed to be that the rate limiting step was, was getting that polymerase to enter into productive elongation. And indeed this is a point where uh, that is regulated and, and HSF bringing in indirectly this PTFB kinase is critical for that step. 
But what about this, this formation of the promoter proximal pause? What's, what, what are the sequence specific transcription factors that establish this pause? So one candidate uh, we had was Gaga factor, not related to Lady Gaga, I don't, uh, I don't think. <laughs> but um, a factor nonetheless um, that, uh, that was very abundant in Drosophila cells, uh, and it uh, was known to occupy uh, promoter proximal regions. Uh, it's a prototype, you know, prototype genes like HSP70 have Gaga factor bound. Uh, Gaga elements and GAF chip peaks are enriched, are enriched on pause genes, as shown by the Gilmore and Levine labs uh, initially. Uh, Gaga binds at uh, genes with proximal focus pausing. Uh, we know that Gaga factor correlates with this, this strong pausing that we see that's very clustered and tight. Um, and uh, Gaga factor um, can has been actually shown to recruit one of the pausing factors. So it could possibly play a role there. So we decided to look genome-wide at what effects are of knocking down Gaga factor, uh, what effects knocking down Gaga factor have on the, on the genome. And so uh, we first did ChIP-seq to show indeed that the, the knockdown uh, has occurred af after RNAi treatment. So we have untreated and RNAi treated. We see some of the peaks, the peaks are, are reduced. And then we can then do uh, nuclear run-ons. In this case, we had, we had done GrowSeq before, before we made the commitment to ProSeq. And uh, in both knockdown cells and not in knockdown controls, and here's the control, just a lack Z RNAi. We can see here's a gene being transcribed right to left. Here's one, uh, no, left to right, and this one right to left. And we can see the pause polymerases here, and then we can examine what happens in the Gaga factor knockdown. And we, we see that there is a reduction in the levels uh, of, of pausing on these genes. So GAF appeared to be critical for pausing of at least some genes. And to look again genome-wide, uh, and we can plot out the, the ratio of the signals we see um, uh, for promoter reads, RNA polymerase promoter reads by, by GrowSeq. Uh, uh, after an RNA, uh, comparing the ratio of an RNAi on Gaga factor versus a control, and we can identify these as in red dots as significantly genes where there are significantly show significantly reduced pausing, and there are about 140 genes that show reduced pausing, and the vast majority of them have Gaga factor bound promoters. So that's that's broadly that's genome wide. What is Gaga factor doing at these heat shock? genes, at the genes that are inducible by, or regulated by heat shock. And, and we then looked at those that are activated, those that are unregulated, and then those that are repressed. And we can see that here that Gaga factor uh, it is indeed uh, playing a role, and it, uh, well, let me say it correlates, <laughs> Gaga factor correlates with, uh, its position co correlates with distance from the TSS, that most, the, the, in the case of the activated genes, we have Gaga. Uh, uh, much more Gaga associated closely with the transcription start sites, um, much less so with uh, re repressed and unregulated genes. Uh, and so Gaga factor seems to be intimately associated with the activated genes, and indeed if you plot out the ChIP-seq in intensity uh, for these different, as a function of TSS, it's, it's most strongly um, uh, associated with these activated genes, uh, just in terms of total amount of Gaga factor. So 75% of the activated genes are uh, Gaga bound. You know, in fact, when you think about this, and they're bound even within 100 bases, it looks like it. So, if we were to found this uh, genome-wide result initially, we would probably call Gaga factor heat shock factor, right? Uh, we won't. We won't go there, though. It's, uh, uh, it's not. Uh, it, it, so, is this related to Gaga factor's role in, in Paul II pausing? Uh, and so, if you look at the correlations between uh, the, the activated heat shock activated genes, and you look at the level of ProSeq, that is the level of pause, this pause polymerase of the promoters, you see that it's already there in high levels. In the case of activated genes, uh, it even goes higher once activated, but it's not there in the case of repressed and unregulated genes. You can't quite see the red here, but it's buried by the blue. Yep, five minutes, okay. HS, so we then do a Gaga factor knockdown and look at the ProSeq reads. And this then allows us to break these up into to, uh, 
So we can do, again, knock down GAGA factor and then look at the, how the gene body expression changes. And, uh, and uh, we're going to focus in on the, those where there are significant changes on the activated genes. And we can see that there are GAGA factor bound genes uh, that are affected. Uh, and, but there are also uh, induction of many GAGA factor bound genes stay unchanged in this GAGA factor knockdown. Um, so GAGA factor uh, is, a, is essential for the activation of only a subset of the genes to which it's bound. So what else is, is there? So we can break these up into classes. Oops, I'm sorry, I got a little bit fast here. Uh, GAGA factor is essential for heat shock activation, not, and then there's some where, it, where it's bound and not essential. And so you can envision, of course, that uh, in the case on the left here, we have, if you knock out GAGA factor, you can uh, knock out, we see a knockout of pausing, and, and, uh, and on the right, we have a GAGA factor, and pausing still persists. So we can then divide these into cl two classes there where there are reduced promoter counts and unchanged promoter counts. And, uh, and we can find that, uh, that uh, these fall into r rather nice classes where you have the, the unchanged here in, in yellow and then the purple here blue when you look at how GAGA factor affects the, the level of transcription during a heat shock compared to a control. So we have those with reduced promoter counts being particularly affected by the um, knockdown. So genes whose pausing levels remain unchanged are still induced by heat shock. They don't seem to uh, care about uh, the GAGA factor. So uh, we know that, the, that these classes of genes, the ones with reduced PAL2 promoter counts, uh, show GAGA factor bound really close to the, tata, to the transcription start site. The ones that don't care, uh, their unchanged promoter counts on a GAGA factor are more dispersed. And likewise, the, uh, the ones with reduced PAL2 counts show a much higher uh, uh, binding of GAGA factor. So what's causing this difference uh, between the, those GAGA dependent and GAGA factor independent? Uh, and so we looked at 92 different chromatin factors and histone modifications. And it turned out the only thing that shows up is our insulators that are on, on GAGA factor bound promoters whose pausing levels aren't affected by GAGA factor. And these insulator proteins, uh, I'm sure you know about, uh, prevent enhancer function, they're architectural proteins. And just to show you how different these are, the ones with reduced promoter counts uh, have very little of this, but those where the uh, promoter counts uh, by, by ProSeq are unchanged are, have high levels of beef, chromatore. And so our vision is that, that the GAGA factor on the GAGA-dependent genes is working to create pause polymerase, but the, the GAGA factor that's bound to these independent genes are perhaps blocked by insulator or insulator itself is creating the pause. What other factors might be involved? Well, is M M1BP, which uh, shows uh, almost a mutual, uh, uh, shows association with these unchained promoters, but, but not with the reduced promoter counts, whereas GAF is enriched for the other class. So that we have these. Um, and just going through a summary here that the activated genes are GAF bound and, uh, and uh, GAF bind is only essential for genes that have GAGA factor dependent pausing. And then there are these cases where the independent genes have insulator or they have this M1BP, which can also seem to set up pausing in Drosophila. Uh, let me just, how many, one minute, two minutes? Okay, so, so how does GAF work, okay, uh, and to, to, to allow pausing? And old studies from Carl Wu's lab showed that, you know, that GAF interacts and, and uh, with remodelers, nucleosome remodelers that keep nucleosomes off. And so we thought this was an attractive model for how this works. And so we examined the, the nucleosomes genome-wide using micrococcal nuclease to digest the way the spaces between nucleosomes, and then we mapped the nucleosomal DNA uh, to the genome by massive sequencing, parallel sequencing. And uh, so here's just the control uh, without any knockdown of GAGA factor for the unaffected and the uh, uh, reduced pausing genes. And they're pretty similar. The reduced pausing has a, little, has a little more nucleosome protection here. But upon GAGA factor knockdown, the nucleosomes fill in on these uh, GAGA factor uh, reduced pausing, the, the, the cases where pausing, promoter pausing is dependent upon GAGA factor. And so our model is that GAGA factor uh, might be blocking directly. Of course, it could be working indirectly, as suggested by um, Karen Adelman's work, that the pause polymerase, if it were set up by GAGA factor, might 
be the, the, the component that, that works on this. So to sort that out, we just simply uh, examine the GAGA factor binding sites away from promoters where there's little polymerase. We looked at a, a lot of these intergenic, uh, over a thousand of these intergenic GAF sites and find that there's a huge difference upon GAF knockdown where nucleosomes fill in. So the model then is, uh, yes, you might have promoters that where pause polymerase keeps the nucleosome off and allow factors and additional polymerase to come in, but we also think GAGA factor itself uh, has, has a, well, or, or with remodelers, has a role even in places where there's no pause polymerase to keep nucleosomes off. Here's the summary, and here are the people who did this, and uh, you let me put halos on those who contributed to this work. Yes, we're all in the same boat, uh, and my collaborators here. And uh, I'll, I'll just put up the summary here so that you can peruse that uh, at your leisure. Yes.